Today I'm learning about one of Napoleon's biggest challenges on the battlefield. It's always the Russian army in the winter that gets you, isn't it? Well, some of it's starting to make its way into here. It looks like wings, but I don't see its head anywhere. Now I know that we're going through the Napoleonic Wars on Epic History TV, but a lot of you guys have informed me that there are some important battles here or there that are missing in that series. Now somebody told me that I should watch this battle of Ailu or Ailau or Ailu. I'm not sure exactly how you say this, so I guess I'm going to find out in the video. At first I was just going to kind of read about it online and continue on with Epic History TV, but as I started reading about it, I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I kind of want to watch a video on this. So that's what I decided to do, so I hope that you guys can indulge me a little bit. For me, it's more important to actually learn the bigger overall picture of this stuff rather than just plowing through a series for the sake of getting through it, you know? As I've said in previous videos, Videos. I'm in this to actually learn the history. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not just doing it as a reaction for YouTube. So I'm going to take my time and enjoy the journey through history and I hope that you guys don't mind that. I did go get a new notebook because the other one I was using had a bunch of other stuff in it and it was almost used up anyway. So I've got this one started and and these are my notes that I took on your comments in my last video with Prussia on the Battle of Jena in 1806. And then in the back of the notebook, I have your recommendations and suggestions for videos that I should watch when you guys mention them as well. I do have a running computer file with all of that stuff in it, but for me, I don't know, it's just a little bit easier to keep track of stuff when it's all together in one place. So in the lead up to this video, we're going to go into the notebook and I just kind of want to recap some of the stuff that I've learned from my previous video because this stuff builds upon each other. And so I really appreciate all of your comments. You guys do teach me a lot. And since I get so many comments, I can't respond to all of them, but just to know that I do read through them. And so some of you guys brought up the point of the fog of war because I brought up that the Prussians basically just gave away that last battle to Devoe. And while I guess some incompetency played a part in that, you guys also told me that, you know, if the unit next to you is running away and there's a lot of smoke and noise from the battle, then you're probably going to run away too because you don't know what's going on, you don't know what they see, and the enemy could come around and flank you without you even knowing and it could be really dangerous so so you just kind of follow suit and then that's how routes begin basically and then some of you guys also brought up the point that the Duke of Brunswick was shot and so that kind of made the command structure fall apart a little bit which also played into Prussia being defeated so good points that I didn't really think about and you guys also let me know that DeVoe is kind of known as Napoleon's best marshal and might have even been better than Napoleon at commanding militaries so, so I want to look into that guy. He sounds really, really interesting to learn about. There were a lot of comments on there about how Napoleon really, really shaped modern Europe because he brought in nationalism, which wasn't really there previously. And then that kind of led to a lot of these countries being formed. And you also made the point that feudalism was really, really big at this point in Europe, which, you know, I remember studying about feudalism in school. And so people in these areas, even though power was changing hands constantly, they were more concerned about more of their local area and their local lord or whoever it was that kind of ruled over them. So that makes total sense because back then they didn't really have modern communication. And so so things were very, very decentralized. And to my surprise, you guys also told me that in World War II, horses were used a lot, especially by Germany. I actually had no idea about that. I've seen pictures of horses in World War I, but for some reason, in all of my things that I have seen about World War II or read about or whatever, I don't think I've ever seen horses in World War II. Maybe it's because I've mostly studied World War II from an American perspective perspective, and I don't think really Americans use a lot of horses. I think most of their transportation was handled by motors. And another point that one of you guys brought up that really caught my eye was that the French had these light troops, and I think the British probably did as well, called uh, Vodic Voltigers? Voltigers? I don't know. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But they were lighter troops that weren't, you know, in the line and they would take cover and they would kind of soften up the enemy lines for the main attack. And from the person that commented on this, they said that that was exported out from the US basically to Europe. And I do know that that was a tactic that the American troops used against the British in the Revolutionary War because they kind of took it from the Native Americans. But I'm not sure if it's the French army that came over to fight with the Americans that took that 
that back to Europe or if the British took it back or maybe they both did. I'm not sure exactly how exactly that was exported over there, but that was really interesting to me. I, I had no idea. I was kind of under the impression from the previous videos I've watched that the European armies were the ones that kind of came up with those light infantry troops and those tactics. I didn't realize that they had taken it from the Americas. And you guys also said that Napoleon kind of fueled a lot of anti-French sentiment, especially in Germany, which kind of led up to World War One and World War Two. So it was kind of neat seeing the foundations of a lot of the modern European history, the stuff that I'm a little bit more familiar with. All right, so that's it for my notes on this one. I just wanted to use that as a lead-in to this video. And also thank you guys again for leaving your comments. They're really appreciated. So I guess we're going to go ahead and get into this video from Kings and Generals. I don't know much about this battle. I don't even know how to pronounce it <laughs> correctly, but it looks like Napoleon was maybe defeated in this or came close to being defeated or something like that. So I thought it was really important to kind of get the context of this battle before going into the rest of the Napoleonic Wars, because it sounds like a really, really important event for Napoleon's army that would have maybe influenced his future battles. So I definitely didn't want to skip over this. So let's go ahead and get into it. In our previous video on the Napoleonic Wars, we described the beginning of the War of the Fourth Coalition and the twin battles of Jena and Orsted that concluded the first phase of the conflict. But the war was Oh, Jena. I'm sorry, I was pronouncing it Jena. That's that was wrong. Just starting, and soon Napoleon was tested by the new Russian army and a harsh winter. Welcome to our documentary on the Battle of Eylau. It's always the Russian army in the winter that gets you, isn't it? The War of the Fourth Coalition erupted in October of 1806, and in less than a month, French Emperor Napoleon had utterly defeated the Prussian army at the battles of Jena and Oersted and occupied Berlin. The Prussians could not oppose the Grand Army, but despite that, King Frederick William III refused to negotiate and fled to Königsberg in eastern Prussia, as he was assured that Russian armies would soon support him. Indeed, 68,000 Russians under Benigsen were in Grodno, and a 40,000 strong force commanded by Buxhoveden was on its way. Napoleon knew that he what video game is this from? Just curious about that. I don't really play video games, but I've seen a lot of video game footage in these history videos and I always wonder what games they come from. Hoveden was on its way. Napoleon knew that he had to decisively defeat the Russians to win the war, but his supply lines were still not secure enough as some of the Prussian strongholds continued their resistance. So, in early November, he sent the Corps of Marshal Davu across the Oder River to prevent the Russians from setting their defensive line there. Fortunately for the French, the main Prussian bastion of Magdeburg fell on November 8th. And on the next day, Davu entered Poznan, which triggered a patriotic Polish uprising. The Poles started fighting against the remainder of the Prussian forces in the area. At the Inspiring nationalism, there you go. The Poles started fighting against the remainder of the Prussian forces in the area. At the same time, the fall of Magdeburg allowed Napoleon to move more corps across the Oder, and that forced Benigsen to stop and wait for his reinforcements. A lack of supplies was preventing Napoleon from marching at his usual fast pace, so he entered Warsaw only on the 19th of December. Still, he attempted a pincer move by moving some of his forces to the north. The Russian troops were spread 60 kilometers to the north of Warsaw, between Poltusk and Galimin. On the 26th of December, the French attacked from the northwest and south, but failed to encircle the Russian troops. Mm. Benigsen managed an orderly retreat to Bialystok, where he decided to winter. Although Napoleon hoped to chase the enemy, the winter was too harsh, and he also had to send his corps back to their winter cantonments. This kind of feels like a rehashing of the Eastern Front of World War II in a lot of ways. I guess history repeats itself, right? Also, uh, what are these yellow flags here? So I see up north we have the white flag. Now, I, I think this bird symbol is Prussia, right? But uh, so we have two flags here with, I guess it's a bird symbol. I don't even know what's on the yellow ones, honestly. It doesn't quite look like a bird. Is that the Russian flag, though? You guys, let me know what these yellow flags mean. Obviously, they're representing Russia here, but... The flags are very different from the Russian flag we have now, so... The winter was too harsh, and he also had to send his corps back to their winter cantonments. 
I like the snow effect. That's cool. Both armies had a hard time procuring rations. By the middle of January, the situation became critical, and Benigsen started moving towards Danzig. It was still controlled by the Prussians and had ample supplies. Coincidentally, Marshal Ney attempted a raid towards Heilsberg on the 17th of January. Napoleon was furious and ordered Ney to return. The latter complied. At the same time, the Russians reached the position of Bernadotte and threatened to cut him off from the majority of French troops. The French Marshal was too quick for them and retreated to the south. The Russians caught up at Murungan, but Bernadotte scored a minor victory and successfully withdrew. I have to say that between the Easter front of World War II videos that I did and a lot of these other ones that I've done, I'm starting to see these military tactics of retreating to keep from being flanked, flanking, encircling, all of this stuff is starting to make sense now. And I'm seeing it repeated over and over again. So some of it's starting to make its way into here. All that gave Napoleon a brilliant idea. He ordered Bernadotte and Ney to continue their withdrawal, while Agereau, Soul, and Davou were commanded to march north. The goal was to cut the Russian retreat and impose a general battle. Unfortunately for Napoleon, constant rains made the road impassable, and on the 31st of January, his messenger to Bernadotte was caught by Russian Cossacks, which allowed Benigsen to learn of the Emperor's plans and retreat. French troops almost caught up to the Russians on two occasions in early February, but Benigsen was able to escape. However, further retreat was impossible, as that would have let the French capture crucial Königsberg. Benigsen stopped at the small town of Prusitjelau, modern-day Bagrationovsk, in Russia. He asked for assistance from the 12,000-strong Prussian corps under Lestock that was nearby. Napoleon knew of the Prussian forces in the area and ordered Ney to prevent them from joining Benigsen, but the Prussians managed to avoid the French Marshal. The Battle of Eylau took place on the 7th and 8th of February, 1807. At the beginning of the battle, the Russians had about 66,000 troops against 45,000 with Napoleon. But the Emperor knew that Ney and Davout, each with 15,000 soldiers, were within marching distance. Okay, the yellow flag does have a bird on it, I think. It's a very strange looking bird, actually. It looks like wings, but I don't see its head anywhere. I have to say, I'm really liking these graphics. I love that I'm kind of getting a feel for what it looked like for real on the battlefield. Well, you know. As, as real as CGI lets you, I guess. But I do like Epic History TV's overview of the battlefield where they're showing the lines and stuff like that. But I also think that this is a really cool way to do it as well, so. The Russians had a decided advantage in artillery with 450 guns against Napoleon's 200. Benigsen needed time to set up his troops to the northeast of Ela, So he left his rear guard under the command of Bagration to cover the deployment. The Russian general was able to repulse the French initially, but by midday, Augereau and the Imperial Guards joined the battle and Bagration had to retreat under overwhelming French pressure. Bagration retreated towards the main army, while General Barclay screened his withdrawal in the town of Eylau. The layout of the town wasn't conductive to an attack, and Barclay managed to defend his positions well into the evening. By 2200 hours, he was ordered to move back and join Benigsen. The Russian commander knew that not all of the French troops were present and ordered part of his right flank to strengthen the reserves, which weakened his wing. The morning started with an artillery duel. As the French were expecting the arrival of Davout's corps from the southwest, Sewell was ordered to attack the Russian right and create a diversion. Question for you guys, how far apart are these armies at this point? I can't really tell from the map, it's kind of hard to tell distances on here, but we're seeing multiple towns here, so it looks like that they're kind of a decent ways away from each other, but I don't really know. Obviously, it's within firing distance of cannons. Also, I think it's interesting that the Russians had more cannons than uh, the French. It seems like they always have more like tanks and stuff. <laughs> than everybody else. I mean, in later wars, obviously they didn't have tanks here, but I'm saying like they ha they always seem to have like the bigger guns, you know, they always outnumber whoever they're fighting against. However, the Russians stopped soon, and when the vanguard of Davout's forces arrived, they were intercepted by the cavalry reserve. Napoleon needed to win time to let the remainder of Davout's soldiers join the battle, so he ordered his center and right to attack. 
a blizzard started and blinded the center of the French army led by Augereau. Visibility was so limited that the French artillery mistakenly bombarded Augereau, who walked right into the Russian artillery battery. More than 5,000 French died in the center without reaching the Russian lines, while the French right didn't do much damage to the Russian left. Benigzen counterattacked against the French right, led by Song Hilaire, with his cavalry and forced it to stop its advance, while his infantry moved against the French center, which was defended by what was left of Augereau's corps. However, Napoleon still had his guard to send in. While the infantry units joined the center and stopped the enemy advance, the cavalry portion of the guard attacked the Russians from the rear, and the majority of this column was destroyed. The French also had Moraz cavalry in reserve, and it was ordered to counterattack. The right wing of these units attacked the Russian cavalry fighting Song Hilaire's right flank and scattered them. Murat and Saint Hilaire continued their movement, and although the infantry was stopped, their cavalry charge dispersed every Russian unit in front of it and reached the reserves. At this point in the battle, Davout's remaining troops arrived and attacked the Russian left. And while Su, Augereau, Murat and the guard held their positions, Davout, supported by Saint Hilaire, pushed the Russians back and by 1530, the Russian left and left center were almost at a 90 degree angle to the rest of the forces. Oh wow, look at that. Luckily for Benigzen, 9,000 Prussians commanded by Lestock entered the battle and joined the beleaguered Russian left. The Prussians attacked Davu from the right and slowly pushed him away. By 1900 hours, Davu had to retreat and set a line between the villages of Kutschitten and Anklappen. Around that time, Ney's corps, which was supposed to stop Lestock, entered the fray. His forces moved against the extreme right of the Russian troops, but Benigzen used the remainder of his cavalry to intercept them. The battle continued until 2200 hours, at which point the sides disengaged. Both so armies me? lost at least 15,000 troops, and it is possible that Napoleon's army suffered more casualties. Despite that, at 2300, Benigzen ordered a retreat. The French were in no shape to chase the enemy. And although the battlefield belonged to Napoleon, it was clear that for the first time in his career, he had failed to win a decisive battle. Eilau indicated that the War of the Fourth Coalition was far from over. Thanks for watching our documentary on the Battle of Eilau. Okay, so to me, that battle looks like more of a stalemate than an actual victory or defeat. Although I guess technically Napoleon won because the Russians did retreat. But yeah, I would imagine that that battle kind of gave Napoleon a bit of a scare or a bit of a kick in the pants. I don't know. But I would imagine that, you know, if I was in charge, I would probably reevaluate what happened and what we did wrong and what we could do differently next time, which I guess is what you would do with any battle. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, makes sense, right? Yeah, but I really enjoyed this video. I made those connections between this and the Eastern Front of World War II, which I watched, I don't know, a couple of months ago at this point. We see history repeating itself. We see those connections being put into place. And I know from you guys that Napoleon did eventually try to invade Russia and take Moscow, which he didn't do in the end. But really interesting stuff. I really enjoyed the graphics in this and the point of view, the way they showed the battlefield and everything. I'm still enjoying Epic History TV series as well, but I'm glad that I kind of diverged from that a little bit to see this video. And I can definitely see why this was important to kind of know about before moving to the rest of it. So I appreciate these suggestions. Now, if there are other videos like this one that Epic History TV does not cover, let me know because I don't know enough on my own to know if I'm missing something. So, so if you guys can answer any of my questions in the comments below, or if you want to add anything to the discussion, please feel free to do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video make sure that you like and subscribe. Roger and I certainly appreciate all of the support you guys have been showing on this channel. We're growing a little bit each day and Roger and I have so much more content that we're going to bring to you so make sure you stay tuned for all of that and we will see you next time.